Hello and welcome everyone to the Formlabs User Summit in 2022. Um, I am very excited to be hosting a panel today on extreme environments for 3D printed parts. Uh, we have a, a few panelists here who will be introducing themselves in a moment, but the focus of today's discussion will be additive material performance and selection in extreme environments. Uh, so first off, I'll introduce myself as the moderator. Uh, my name is Chris Crowley. I run our aerospace and defense team at Formlabs. That entails a, a lot of different work, but uh, I will uh, show you a couple of the customers that we work with here that are examples, and they do stress our parts a little bit. So uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, so we do work with federal defense and aerospace customers. You can see if you could basically name a logo or a four letter organization in the government, we do work with them. Every national lab in the Department of Energy would be an example. Uh, the NASA, I purposely chose the worm logo. It's nostalgic. I like that one. And a little shout out to uh, Sherry's organization here. Uh, every branch of the military and the contractors and suppliers that support them, as well as things that fly, fly up into space, fly in the air. Uh, these are all customers we work with, and they do put the put the screws to our parts. Next one. So uh, I have had the uh, pleasure of working with some of our Impact Award nominees at the User Summit this year, uh, both of which are actually government customers in one way or another. Brad Baker at the Naval Academy, who developed a radiation detection device with 3D printing. So 3D printing in the environment of uh, near a nuclear reactor, a nuclear engine on a submarine would be an example there of an extreme environment. And then uh, Carolyn Kincaid, who uh, works for Alberta Health Services, Provincial Health Care um, in Canada. And believe it or not, the human body is a very extreme environment for parts. So we do have some biocompatible materials that, that withstand that. And they're both nominees. So please stay tuned uh, for the nominations and impact award notifications. And uh, some examples that I have customers who see uh, customers put our parts into one would be wind tunnels, so extreme high wind environments where stiffness is really important. Actually, if you get into hypersonic speeds, uh, the leading edge of parts gets very, very hot in a wind tunnel. They actually stay cold, but in reality, those undergo both uh, stress from uh, the actual uh, wind and air going by, but also heat. We have actually seen parts printed in an extreme environment at sea while underway for a NOAA vessel. Uh, that's a, a pressure enclosure in standard clear resin that did go down to 200 meters of ocean depth. So tons of pressure and it needs to be watertight, uh, gas tight as well. And uh, even at places like Brookhaven National Laboratory where customers will use uh, experimental fixtures to hold uh, articles in place during particle beamline acceleration. I mean, they're, they're also extreme acid, uh, all sorts of different ways that, that people use our advanced materials like rigid 10K that you see on there. So uh, we do run the full gamut and get exposed to quite a bit of different uh, different pieces. So next we'll go over to Ross, who can introduce himself and his company and the role. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Ross. Uh, so I'm the lead product designer here at Heliguy in the UK. Uh, my job is to have a bit of a, a top-down analysis of the, the types of products that we, we create here at Heliguy. Um, we do a lot of stuff with drones, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, the drones are our primary source of, uh, of income, as well as uh, working with the technology that is inside drones. Uh, we have a couple of different streams of the way that we design our, our products. And one of those is uh, to take drone technology um, and uh, reimagine re it for uh, other verticals. Uh, one of the products we've recently released is our wireless video camera for police dogs. You can see a couple of pictures on the uh, on the screen there. Um, we've also created um, protection systems for drones, uh, cages, as well as um, fully 3D printed cages, uh, as well as so, so experimental shapes. Uh, we have a number of machines that we run there. Uh, specifically, uh, we've, we've got uh, some fantastic Formlabs machines. We do run other things as well, but uh, we'll focus on Formlabs today. Um, our extreme environments can range uh, from, from being in very, very dusty environments, low light coarse quarters, uh, GPS denied environments. You can imagine there's quite a lot of high impacts there. Um, all the way through uh, to urban real world environments for uh, sudden impacts and needing long, long run times where the parts can get quite warm, as well as uh, being handled by humans in quite aggressive manners. So our parts need to be strong, they need to be lightweight, and moreover, they need to be cheap as well. So that's one of the, the big driving factors for us. Excellent. Okay, and we'll throw it over next to <laughs> Sherry Thorne from NASA. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Sherry Thorne. I'm an aerospace engineer at NASA. Um, and our job is basically putting things into space, whether it be a near Earth orbit or deep space. Um, some of the parts that I've been working on have been some ladder structures here. I just wanted to show you all. Um, basically, what we wanted to do here is kind of show basically what Ross said, um, how we can take lightweight parts or cheaper parts and create them so that they can possibly survive in the space environment. Um, these two pictures that you see here um, are just showing the rigid 10K. Um, we put it in a, a compression test and you can see how it crumbles when you put a little bit of pressure on it. Um, I think it broke around 160 pounds. Um, when you put a little bit of a metal coating on the outside, we got it to around 2,500 pounds. Um, and then you can see me standing on one of the samples right there um, as just an example of it working. And our next slide, we're just showing some parts that we've taken and actually put in space just to see the effect of space on actual parts. Um, these are just some tinsel samples, but the goal is to see what our environment does to these samples so that we can possibly use them in the future. So that's our project so far. Excellent. And I definitely want to point out, uh, Sherry standing on that part was not the crush test. That part can definitely <laughs> no, withstand us. Can withstand a lot of weight. So next we'll go over to Matthias. Hi, I'm Matthias. I'm CEO of the Expector company. We are manufacturer of um, carrier systems for night vision and thermal cameras for boats, also for cars. Um, we sell it to our customers, uh, maybe for hunters, so for hunting, also for law enforcement and also for the military. Our extreme environments, also you can see it's mounted on the rooftop of a car, uh, weather conditions like rain, snow, sun, and all of this stuff. Um, yes, and to the, we, we try to, in the moment, we try to develop uh, some carrier systems for boats. So we make also make it um, resistance for seawater, salt water, and something like that. So in the in the right picture, you see we also made our gears for the carrier systems uh, in Formlabs SLA printers. There you can see it's a Form 3L. So we make our complete gear sets out of durable resin. Um, yes. Excellent. Okay, thank you for the primer. So now we'll we'll go uh, to a little bit of a deeper dive of extreme environments. Obviously. Sherry, space is an extreme envir environment, but getting parts to space, what they do in space, where they are in space is going to make a big difference. So can you talk a little bit about more details of the extreme environments? There are several of them I gather the parts have. So talk to us about uh, what the parts will undergo when they are launched up in there. Okay, so first you have to get to space. Like you mentioned earlier, um, to get to space, you have to break gravity, <laughs> which is pushing down on us at all times. Um, and with that, you have vibrations of your spacecraft or just acoustics um, actually hitting your part. And depending on the shape, it can almost be like a drum or it could just be vibrating just all over the place. Um, so very important that your parts can withstand all of that in order to get into space. Uh, when you get into space, um, the temperature environment can be extreme. It can be extremely hot. It can be extremely cold. Um, and you can also, if you're staying near Earth or going around any other planet um, or a star, you can, it varies. So Earth is one set of temperatures. The sun is another set. Um, going to another planet, whether it be Venus or Mars, Mercury, all of those things are a different set of temperatures. Also, if you go to deep space, it's freezing cold. So <laughs> those are the things you have to keep in mind um, when you're sending something to space. Um, in addition to that, if you are staying around Earth's orbit, you have things like the atmosphere that actually can affect whatever you're putting up there because you have the atmosphere particles hitting your part constantly. Um, going around the Earth, it's getting hot and cold every single time it goes around. Um, so you can have fatigue issues from it going extremely hot and then getting really cold. Um, other things to keep in mind is you have radiation from the sun, you have gamma rays from deep space, you have supernovas and things, you know, expelling things constantly 
Um, and another thing to keep in mind is that you have different pressures um, from Earth. So on Earth, you have a certain pressure and then, you know, you lose that pressure when you go to space. Um, so outgassing is a major issue as well um, because your part could be holding, you know, contaminants or things in and it releases all that when it goes to space. So if you have important particle um, optics, I mean, if you have per important optics around that stuff can get on your um, your optics and you might not be able to see anything, which would be a major issue. So that's our environment. It's pretty crazy, but um, it's cool at the same time. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, the, everything is undergoing an extreme environment in space. So even if your 3D printed part is is outgassing, you're you're creating a problematic environment for the equipment that surrounds it. That's a, definitely exactly. an extra consideration there. Um, so literally coming back down to Earth, uh, but maybe touching on the idea of radiation from the sun, Ross, uh, with your parts uh, flying or, or, or being uh, on, a, on an officer, essentially, even if it's a canine officer, could you tell us just a little bit more about your main concerns with uh, the extremity of where your parts go? Sure, of course. So when we're designing parts, um, whether they're going to be um, on a dog or in the sky, um, the, the main two considerations that we have are it needs to be lightweight and it needs to be strong. So one of the uh, the main concerns is when, when you're flying, when you're flying, there's a lot of stress on the parts, right? So if you've got a lot of acceleration, that part's going to want to bend, it's going to want to shift and move. So we have to make sure that our parts that we print for that are going to go into the sky are strong, they're fairly rigid um, they're flexible but also they have they can return back to where they want they have elasticity so we can have a lot of different environmental changes in the sky there's a lot of temperature changes i think a lot of people think oh it's only going up a couple of hundred meters it's about the same temperature as on the ground that's not true at all um you can sometimes only a couple of hundred meters up there could be temperature differences of 10 20 degrees c sometimes so when you're flying um, a large drone, uh, there's quite a lot of heat being generated in certain areas and the motors, for, for example, but in the middle of the body or in the middle of an arm, there might be uh, almost a negative temperature. So there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge temperature differences over parts. Um, we also have to uh, not just assume it's going to take off, but it's going to land at some point, right? So we need our parts to be able to take those impacts and it can't land just once. It needs to land hundreds of times. So when we're designing parts, we need them to be uh, highly testable and tested in real environments so that we can be sure that these things are going to are going to survive in the real world. Um, humans handling parts as well, uh, I found it can be a, a certain extreme environment. Um, People uh, often assume parts are going to just work, which they should do if they're in a real environment. So designing parts with the, the, the human handling in mind, especially when you're working with emergency services that are going to need to deploy these things very quickly, they can be handled very aggressively, uh, sometimes with not as much care as you would assume the average consumer would do so. So um, quite a lot of challenges put on uh, designing these parts to be able to handle extreme temperature, extreme stress, extreme stress changes, impacts, but also the general day-to-day -day handling and, uh, uh, and deployment of emergency services as well. So it's that could be certainly a challenge. Yeah, for sure. And obviously, if uh, we have a, a dog helmet, we want those dogs to be safe. And obviously, the, the dogs are going places where there's obviously human human handling that is not the people of the customer. It's the human handling of, of uh, you know, potentially uh, violent people coming after yeah. it. So it definitely has to be strong enough to withstand that and protect the officer. Um, uh, Matthias, uh, kind of similar I idea where there could be same kind of exposures, but uh, very different products. So can you talk a little bit about your environment and, and what your parts see and, and have to consider? Yeah, our, our environments are most of the time are outdoor environments. That means uh, also forest, um, off-road streets and something like that. So we have also impacts from trees, um, vibrations from the, from the rooftop of the car, vibrations from different cars have different type of vibrations. So we also make uh, or try to make the, the, the picture as um, stabilized as possible. We need also um, parts that can be handle a lot of stress but also maybe the, the, um, the foot of the carrier system have to be a little bit flexibility. So not only to be too hard, but gets a little bit of uh, flexibility. Um, 
Temperature, I think it's not uh, the big problem for us because mo most of our products are there are no no much um, temperature differences. Um, also for the SL8 parts for the gears, um, the only problem is to make it the the let me let, what's the word. UV, <laughs> UV, the stress okay. for the sun, you know. So, so we, so we hide the parts in in our housing of the of the T crow, and yeah, that's it. I think the, yeah. the next challenge will be uh, the sea environment. So, sea water and something like that. But for also for the for the T crow, we use a uh, impregnation, so we make it waterproof. So that's the big challenge to make the parts waterproof. We also use um, FDM print uh, to print our ceilings and something like that for the complete housing. Yeah, that's it. Excellent. And I think you mentioned uh, watertight or even waterproofing. You guys accomplish that, you know, almost regardless of the additive part with some sort of coating or something along that line? Yeah, we use a, a special kind of coating to make it waterproof. Excellent. Okay, great. Uh, one thing that I know coming into form labs, not having thought about 3D printing, but now having it be basically every every moment of my life, I didn't really know that much that 3D printed plastics were so different from injection molded plastics or even machine plastic to think, you know, why didn't we 3D print everything, right? Like you don't 3D print forks and knives. It doesn't make sense. They're not custom. The materials don't make any sense. Um, so to talk about a little bit about uh, material selection and uh, getting into different manufacturing processes. I was, I'd like to know a little bit more about how your organization has come into using 3D printing and, and where the decision making about it being in an extreme environment where you have a, maybe a well-established material prior comes into place. So Sherry, your job is not 3D printing at NASA. Your job is very much different. 3D printing maybe uh, is supplementary. So you can explain about maybe why you guys are even allowed to 3D print and why you wouldn't be? Um, that's a good question because I'll start off saying I was talking to one of my senior engineers yesterday and I asked him the exact question. I, was, I asked him, why, how do you feel about 3D printing? And his response was, it's the future, basically. <laughs> yeah. um, he was saying that it would be a tool that we use basically in our toolbox. Um, just like we have composites, just like we have, you know, just regular machining, it would be a tool that would be able to use for a certain subset, uh, which is why we do testing to figure out exactly where it will fit and how the materials will work. So we know exactly to reach in and pull it out the you know, toolbox. Um, so 3D printing, why we're allowed, <laughs> which is really hard to me at NASA because there's so many you know, standards and guidelines that we have to abide by. But um, why we're allowed is because there's always another question, another frontier we want to explore, you know, and you can't get there certain ways. Um, if we want to be able to go beyond the moon, we have to be able to make parts um, on the fly. And 3D printing is the answer to that. Um, so it's just knowing that if you stay in that box, you can't develop, you can't grow. Um, and 3D printing really is the next big thing, uh, or it is, it already is a big thing, but um, developing it so that it can be used in space um, on other planets, on the moon, you know, is something that will allow us to expand beyond our little, our little planet. So um, that's why. Yeah, very good. I mean, it seems like NASA kind of has to, in the space industry, kind of has to adopt 3D printing because of its flexibility and inherently being an extremely short run uh, compared to even even aircraft, it's much more short run going into space. Like automotive has these crazy volumes, aircraft has a lower volume, and space is another uh, level of, of lesser. And we know 3D printing, the fewer you make, the more likely it makes sense to do a 3D printed uh, thing. So that kind of actually goes well into to Ross, where uh, your industry is kind of the opposite. Whereas NASA said everything has to be made of the same titanium or aluminum or Teflon or whatever the crazy material is that we've been using because we know it so well your industry is kind of the opposite. It's almost like 3D printing is almost built in. So maybe you can talk about how the drone industry kind of almost requires 3D printing. 
Yeah, so I mean, my background in drones goes back over a decade from building really tiny little races and, and, and playing around with them all the way through to the to the modern age of, um, of distributed uh, manufacturing and drones. So um, when you think of a hobbyist drone and a little three, a 3D printed uh, little frame and you bolt the motors on and you put your flight controller on and off you go. Um, the 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 more modern drones that are they've got injection molded parts they are using they're not even using carbon arms anymore they might be they might look like carbon arms but they actually are metal or they they you know or, or plastic that of some kind of a formed tube um but i found that um one of the the things that we want to do and achieve as a company especially in the drone world is to innovate uh, at an accelerated pace. So the, the drone world itself is a very fast changing world. Whereas uh, someone uh, someone in the, in the automotive industry might they might have a very small innovation every year, a couple of percent maybe, even that. Where if dr drones have changed hundreds of percent a year in some cases. Um, DJI is a fantastic example of that. Um, they've gone from um, building tiny little flight controllers that were for remote control helicopters and stuff 10 years ago to being the behemoth in the world that they are now with some of the, the most advanced, if not the most advanced drone technology in the world. Um, and we, a heli guy, we want to be able to to build on on that type of success and that type of thinking, which takes us very quickly to the we need to be able to fail fast mentality. So we want to be able to produce a part in house and go, okay, does that work? Get it in the air. Does it work? And if it doesn't work, great, that's a good thing because now we know how not to make that part, and we can we can try a different way. Um, and we can we can spin that very very quickly and keep up with that innovation circle. So, three D printing isn't just a necessity within the, the 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 drone industry. If you if you don't have that, then you're unable to keep up. That it's it's right. beyond necessity. It's it's it has to be there. Yeah, for sure. I mean. I think you had said uh, when we were talking before this uh, that you almost aim for almost 99% of your parts to be 3D printed so that they can be yes. totally flexible in the production process. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, speaking of speaking of kind of rapid development in a quickly developing industry, Matthias, I'm amazed at how uh, robust the products you have are and how quickly you guys have actually developed into a, a real company. Can you tell us about kind of you know, how long has Xpector been around and, and how 3D printing played into how quickly you guys were able to basically uh, be producing parts at scale here? So Xpector's on the market since about uh, six months. So we started up the company just a year ago. Um, we also developed uh, very fast, it's like Ross said, uh, if you if you use 3D printing for building a prototype, you can uh, learn very click, quickly from your fails, you know. So yeah. you build another prototype, you do the, the next prototype comes out, you, you assemble the parts, you see, okay, it, it, it's, that works, that works not. So we make a new prototype, so it gets very fast, very fast. And yeah. when you get out the last prototype, then you only, if you want to start a small, a serious production, then you only have to press the start button and you can go directly from your last prototype into serious production. And that's how we do it. Yeah. Or, or we done it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just amazed at how quickly you're able to actually just go straight into production for prototyping. That's, re that's really cool. So when we talk about going from prototyping to production, which is kind of a difficult leap for most people with taking 3D printing in, like, like in industry, for example, making any part of a vehicle where you prototype it and then you have to make 100,000 of them, that's really challenging. Uh, not just from a, a cost and complexity of, of manufacturing with 3D printers, but you have to validate that the part can actually survive the environment. So what I think we should go kind of round robin here on like your role or what part testing or validation comes into so you can actually prove out that it can survive. <clears throat> so Sherry, I know it's the parts you showed, those are tensile bars and we are literally sending tensile bars to the ISS. We're not just putting a, a 3D printed rocket engine that's, that's sending the rocket <laughs> up there. We have to test something first. So tell me a little bit about how there's this huge burden on testing. And then once you can validate that, maybe you can take it into an application where it adds a lot of benefit, like we've talked about fasteners or whatever. But this step is the initial step of even just proving that it can survive. 
Yeah, so the biggest thing that we can do to make sure something can survive is to do ground testing, um, which I guess everyone does. But for us, the major tests that we do are our, vibra our vib vibration tests and also our um, thermal tests, so thermal vacuum chambers. So something that we did prior to sending those parts up, um, we had a different batch and we did thermal cycling. And I think at some point we took some parts to, I think negative 50 C and then up to 160 C just to see exactly what, what happens to it on the ground before we try and send it up, you know, make sure they're not just gonna disintegrate on us or, you know, just um, get brittle and just crack, you know? Sure. So getting those tests done prior is what allows us to have that peace of mind to know, okay, this is our environment. Let's test it as well as we can on the ground. Um, we have the same test as you fly. Um, so basically you test as you fly and you fly as you test. Um, so we'll know once it gets up there, it works. So doing those tests are basically the precursor to getting those check boxes, knowing that it meets all these standards and all the guidelines um, to know that it will work once it gets to space. So um, testing is like literally can't send it up. Don't test it. Don't send it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think that's what's key for allowing us to get to that next level, um, because a lot of times, unlike everyone else, we don't send, you know, a lot of the parts we make are one offs. It's that it's that one part so it has yeah. to work. Uh, we might have a backup, but you're not going to we're not going to make millions of them um, over the course of time. So testing it, making sure that it works is basically how we operate to yeah. know that we won't have failures. Definitely. And and what I gather is a lot of what you have to do is you have to test this part. And even now you're at the point where we did launch the parts this summer into space to go test uh, plated and unplated versions of the parts. And that kind of testing and characterization can help you determine where does it make sense? So as soon as we validate that this material can survive in space, does that mean that we make the entire air spacecraft out of it? Absolutely not. Maybe it's now we know it's suitable for a bracket. It's not suitable for a gasket or, 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 a, or a propulsion nozzle or anything like that. So obviously there's a, t there's a place for each material. There's a place for even 3D printing in the beginning. Ross, can you talk about, I mean, we've talked about creep. So like propeller blades undergo very different uh, behavior and, and impact force than just a, a cage on a drone. So like how you go about, where do we put a 3D printed part? Which material do we even choose for that application? Yeah. Knowing that some of them creep or, or become more brittle over time, like talk about that. Sure. So. Um... Uh, when you when we're designing something that we know um, is going to be on a drone or it's going to be in a dog camera or it's going to be used in some sort of um, mad environment, a lot of the, the, a lot of the time um, we will design the part mechanically, so we know that it will it will react well, you know, under a standard uh, engineering process. Um, we'll then print that part in our material, say nylon twelve in the fuse one. Um, and then we'll, un we'll, we'll do a, a full test plan and, and it'll, that part will undergo those tests. Um, we'll then print it, that same part in a different uh, material, like say the glass, the glass fill, nylon 12, or uh, in the carbon fiber version, or, or nylon 11, or wh whatever it is. And we have a, a Form 3L as well, so we do a lot of stuff in with resins. And even just the manufacturing process uh, will change how that part reacts. Um, so if you're making, say, a housing that goes, uh, it's going to hold a motor on, you need that to be strong, you need it to be very, uh, um, it, it can't flex, you need it to be able to handle the thermal characteristics of that motor. Um, so we might choose to use um, something like nylon 12 or if using, using the glass fill or, or uh, even, a, even the rigid 10K uh, for, for that particular part. And we, when we're testing these things, uh, we'll have a test bed set up. Uh, like Sherry said, we test on the ground first before we put it in the air. Um, but as we gain in confidence, okay, yeah, that part can handle that, that part can handle that. There's only so far that you can get with ground testing before you just need to put it through the mill. Um, and quite often that becomes a very nerve wracking experience of bolting it on a drone and just flying it. Um, so to that effect, uh, we, we, have, we have a test field um, where we can go and fly drones in a secure area and, and we can, we've all got cameras set up and that kind of thing. So we can, uh, we can fly the drone and see it in, in, at a high speed uh, flying past a, a camera, uh, which is filming at like 240 FPS. So we can see as the blade is spinning, is it flexing a lot or is that bracket twisting in some strange way that we didn't expect? Um, 
so we do we do a lot of that um we do some simulation as well uh, to gauge roughly where we're going with it before we print the parts so we can do a little bit of that first as well just to get us on the right track but for us again that very fast uh, pace of um print and test print and test um it's pretty much just okay that that needs to change in some way here's the change we're going to do we're going to change that one parameter change it print it test it yeah for sure i mean it's a huge advantage the flexibility of production and um we'll talk about now I, matthias i think you've talked about how you leverage this uh extreme environments any plastic will degrade or have trouble in extreme environments so it doesn't matter if you injection molded or machined delrin or anything like that uh parts go out there and when they're on a vehicle they fall off or anything happens a, a tree limb comes down parts break it doesn't matter if they're 3d printed or not but you can talk about how like 3d printing has been an advantage for you guys and even if something does break this is true for, for ross's company too why why it makes sense to 3d print a part when you know it could break no matter what it's made of Mm -hmm. So so we did a lot of development in our gears and shafts and, and so on. So maybe the, the main problem for us was the, the SLA stuff because we want to print our gears by ourselves. And we also tried rigid. Rigid was a little bit too hard. So we, it's like Ross, also like Ross said, print, test, print, test, find out the best tolerances uh, for your parts, then print again, start testing again. And then at least we came to durable because durable had uh, this uh, little bit of self-greasing feature. It's very good for, for um, gears, also for shafts. And yeah, now we use this. And, and the, the, the main advantage uh, for this reprinting also for the gears is you can make little changes also in your serious production so the customer don't don't see so don't see these changes it's just a little bit of tolerances when when the guys in the production made uh, mm, this chef gets a little bit uh, too hard in in into the the gear shaft or something like that can we made it can we can we uh, choose other materials can we made the tolerance tolerances a little bit more or less or something like that you can made it overnight and that's i think that's the the main advantage of using 3d printing for prototyping but also yeah. for serious production for sure so then i mean getting into a little bit of the kind of how you either like sell your product or or in or uh leverage the advantage even in perception from your customers of 3d printing sherry obviously you guys aren't like a profit driven organization with, with nasa but um i mean 3d printing is kind of seen as this innovation so that that helps not only the flexibility of your mission but you know driving funding and showing that you're in advance so when you're using 3d printing that helps kind of uh with how you're moving your projects along and and showing off a little bit about your capability at nasa i assume yeah, another conversation that I had with uh, the senior engineer that I spoke with earlier was us being able to work with more like universities um, with 3D printing. That's a big, it's a big thing. Um, and also working with um, just other organizations, just in general, um, even within NASA. We have several centers, right? We yeah. specialize in different things. Um, I know Marshall, they are heavy with 3D printing versus Garter we don't have as heavy as a 3D printing, you know, shop or center as they do. So it allows us to have more collaborations, which they love, <laughs> you know, yeah. love the concept of us working with others, um, working with other organizations, because that's kind of, I mean, we're the government, that's what we're supposed to do. So um, it is a good selling point. I'm not necessarily selling point, but it's, it's just good to know that, you know, we're unifying versus yeah. we do this and only we can do it, you know, so um yeah for sure have to work with others I'm, I'm good <laughs> yeah so so digital manufacturing is just more transferable from one location to another and you can actually build on what other people have succeeded on so ross when when you guys have a a product that is in inevitably going to go under impact like it's going to be uh broken it's, i would think that 3d printing would be a huge advantage in being able to say our product is rapidly replaceable like you could have replacement art parts really quickly. So yeah, we have right. these customers who, who might be suspect about saying, oh, this should be 3D printed or should this be made the way I always expected my clips and mounts and helmets to be made? Or you might say it should be 3D printed, 
because it's going to be able to be me. It'll be easier for us to get you back on track when you lose something. Yeah, of course. I mean, the, the, the dog camera is a fantastic example of that. So it, the, the type of environment that's going to go in, it's going to get broken. But yeah. we, we're not we're not trying to hide that. It's going to get broken at some point. It's going to get broken before the electronics fail. OK, so we we uh, work quite closely with a lot of police forces already, and we know how important it is for them to stay in operation. So. By us, by us being able to three D print stuff, it means that we can print on demand of, pro of broken parts. So a police force can send in a, a a broken part, and we can go, okay, no problem. That's the part that's broken. We print it overnight. It all gets finished the next day. It gets installed and it gets shipped back to them. So they can have a, a repair turnaround of a couple of days versus you know it could be weeks or even months, depending if, if the parts are in stock or not. It also means that we don't have to hold parts in stock. We just have to hold the material in stock. So we, sure. can, we can just have a material library on our shelves. And OK, we need to print this part. This is, this is the, the definition of that part. This is the material it's printed in. Grab that material, print the part. It's, it, it, so we can print on demand as many parts as we need, um, have the repair turnarounds faster. It also allows us to, to make parts make less parts, right? So if, if you've got a complex shape, traditional manufacturing, you're gonna have to make multiple parts to bolt together to make that complicated shape. However, in 3D printing, it's built into the to the ecosystem that, that the, the DNA of 3D printing, it's all complicated shapes that you can't normally make anyway, right? So we, we can make parts that are one part rather than multiple parts, reducing part cost, but also reducing manufacturing time as well. So if we're doing batch production of stuff, we can do, you know, we'll run 50 parts off and then we don't have to run 100 individual parts, which we then have to bolt together or glue together and all that stuff. We can just print them, finish them, done. So manufacturing, repairs, uh, reducing downtime of our customers. It's 3D printing is a, an uncalculable advantage, especially in-house. Like we, we couldn't. We couldn't do 3D printing out of house either. We yeah. we 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 need it in house, um, and everyone in the engineering team that I'm part of is all trained in 3D printers. So we can we we just have no downtime <laughs> at all for our yeah. 3D printers. That's excellent. And uh, Matthias, I know uh, you know when I now knowing more about you know SLA parts, and you talked about kind of keeping them inside and protect protecting them there sometimes could be, I mean, you, you don't market or advertise your 3D print, your parts as a 3D printed enclosure or anything like that, but even just uh, customer perceptions, if they notice, I mean, you say like hunters, hobbyists, they, they know about 3D printing, they might assume that it is. Um, longevity can be some perceived concern of 3D printed parts. So how have you found the longevity of parts and how they can survive just long-term use? Because uh, your parts are just sitting out there on a vehicle for, for months at a time. How, how have you found that and how have you dealt with that if it became an issue or has it even been an issue? Mm, we have no issues uh, in the time with the SLS parts, also not with the SLA parts. <clears throat> I think it's the most problems we, we will become uh, is when we, I told you before, when we uh, make the, the Seacro ready for the launch. So th that's our biggest challenge. Um, but it's also like Ross said, when, when some of our customers use, we, we sell the different adapters. You have a lot of cameras, night vision cameras, thermal cameras on the market. And if one of our customers um, gets a new camera, we try to make a new adapter. So, so if they make us a sketch or we get the camera, we, we can make a new adapter overnight. So if you, you just think about the adapter, sketch it, get it in the in the computer get it into the printer and overnight you have a new adapter we can can handle out to our um customers yes excellent great well uh yeah i mean i think that uh there's reasons to leverage 3d printing from a business perspective but obviously there there's reasons when you when your parts are short run and being kind of uh hammered by all the environments that we can that we've seen that make a big difference I just want to give a, a last opportunity for you guys to have any any closing thoughts on uh, where you think um, kind of a next gen type of uh, survival. I, I think coatings and platings is a really cool uh, environment. I see, uh, sorry, uh, application 
expander for 3D printing. Uh, sherry plating has been like electroplating has basically introduced this. Why did you why did you electroplate the parts? Other than the structural, you said that there's advantages beyond uh, just like making a part stronger, right? Reasons you would add coating to a part, correct? Yeah, there's a lot to go. So you could go into the electrical aspect or even the, um, the thermal aspect. You have advantages on both sides. Um, I know for me, it was a cost savings, a mass savings, and a schedule saving. And that is, those are all yeses <laughs> when it comes to uh, like working with a project because they always need to save on mass because for every everything's in space, that's more money, um, more time, lead time. Um, I remember getting a part machined, they gave me like a four to six week quote um, or delivery time. And these parts I could print in a day or less, you know, yeah. and then sending it out to get plated within a week, I had the stuff back. So those were like those real advantages that people don't see and they don't think about, but there's just so many open doors that you can't even think about. And you can put anything on top of this. We use nickel, but there's so many other things that we could do. So I'm excited to see what comes next. Yeah, and we've we've seen things like uh, Cerakoting. Uh, that is another thing that you could do where you, the, the materials can take this on. And I think it's just really interesting that we could take a 3D printed part and if someone could say, okay, this isn't as strong as the material I need, like we don't, we need the titanium, for example, you can take a much more inexpensive, it's very expensive. The people at NASA Marshall would tell you that it's extremely expensive to print titanium to get the machine to even run a print. So you're kind of like cutting corners or almost like cheating using a polymer and then plating mm -hmm. it with metal where the more additively manufactured it is, like a more lattice structure, the, actually the stronger it gets when you put the, the metal plating on because of the exactly. surface area. Um, and Matthias, I like how you talked about waterproofing uh, those parts and putting coating on them can, can really expand where you could use additive. Um, so for, for Ross or Matthias, any, any final comments where you would say, like, what do you think might unlock more use of 3D printing uh, to go beyond the environments it in? Do you, do, have you, do you guys explore that or are you guys just happy as can be with 3D printed parts as they are with what you have? Um, we are looking at next gen as uh, processing techniques. So post post processing is for us as important as the 3D printing itself. So um, for us, again, lightweighting, stronger, more uh, applicable parts. Um, I'm looking into uh, the ability to put uh, active electronics directly onto the surface of 3D printed parts. Um, there's a, a few different ways of doing this. Um, there's uh, LDS is the main one that we're looking at, which is a uh, laser direct structuring, uh, which allows us to basically put a, a polymer coating on a on a, a 3D printed part. A laser then activates an area of that part, and then you dunk it into a a, a copper. I think it's copper nitrate solution, and it it, it plates the part in in the areas that you that you uh, you laser it. Um, this allows you to have an electronic circuit directly on the part itself. So it's a three-dimensional le electronic structure, not just the PCB-based uh, one. Now, obviously, there's there's some drawbacks to that, mainly that in you can't get very fine structures. Um, it's very sort of wide wide tracks, maybe half a millimeter as a minimum. Um, but you can put, you know, decent signals through that already. So if you're wanting to send basic signals from one side of the part to the other side of the part, even even power is possible. Um, we could we could print that onto the the inside of uh, of, a, of a housing, for example, and we could completely eliminate the requirement for having a, uh, a power management system. Uh, the, you know, the, the components themselves could be soldered directly inside that PCB, uh, the 3D printed part, sorry, and yeah. uh, it, you remove a whole part, uh, which uh, is could be cost saving, weight saving. It's uh, the benefits are, are very high. So that, for me, that's 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 our next step. Very cool. And Matthias, one thing that, that I know that you have talked about is uh, when you handle the 3D printed parts, sometimes like SLS parts, uh, even just human beings interact with them, touching them, like you guys apply a coating for almost like an aesthetic pur purpose to, to preserve the appearance or that for your 3D printed parts to make them handle a little bit more and, and look better in the field for longer. Can you tell us about that a little bit? Yes, we use a special fluid that we just um, get our parts sifted, get our parts sandblasted, then we make uh, our threads, we we melding, melding our, our threads in it, and then it, we dip it in a special fluid that makes the parts a little bit more darker, 
and uh, makes it also okay. more. Let's see for a second there, am I still connected here? Do you hear me? Can you hear me, everybody? We can hear you. I think uh, Chris's uh, video has died. Oh, okay. Oh, you're back, Chris. We've got I you back. I think we're back. We're back online. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, so we make it uh, more waterproof and more dust repellent and something like that. It's uh, a special fluid we use, yes. Excellent. Well, definitely, I think it's uh, it's important to think about 3D printing and 3D printed parts as more than just the part and the raw print process. So uh, there's definitely a lot more to be done. These well-established 3D printed processes of filament and resin and powder, uh, they, they have their advantages. Each one ha has a lot of decision making, even even metal printing all has its own its own advantages where you guys have had really creative ways of getting around some of the limitations where a 3D printed part wouldn't be suitable. And now it is. Um, I can see it's getting dark where Matthias is because he's in the EU. I'm sure the case, uh, Ross, if we had a window next to you as well. Um, I really thank yeah. you all for your time. You guys have done some great work. Um, I, and everybody who, who's been in attendance here, uh, please feel free to uh, join uh, and uh, in the conversation with us and tell us more about your parts. Come up to Form Labs and tell us what you've put your part through. We definitely want to hear that. And uh, we look forward to uh, the continued seeing how you guys continue to implement 3d printing at your companies uh, thank you very much for your time and uh, we'll talk to you soon